Come, baby. Enjoy this great game. They say you see something new in every baseball game. With 162 games per season from each MLB team, it's no surprise that there have been no shortage of amazing and unforgettable moments, incredible comebacks, and epic collapses. But there have also been some weird, wacky, and wild moments as well. And in today's video, we'll be counting down 10 of the wackiest, most insane moments in MLB history. One in a million moments that will likely never be repeated again. So without further ado, let's get into the list. Number 10, JT saves the day. It was game five of the 2002 World Series, the biggest stage in baseball between the San Francisco Giants and the Anaheim Angels. The Giants had two men on in the seventh when Kenny Lofton roped an extra base hit into right field. That's when the Giants' tiny bat boy, three-year-old Darren Baker, the son of manager Dusty Baker, was a little too eager to run out and collect Lofton's bat, the bat of his favorite player. As JT scored, he saw the little boy wandering around the danger zone with another runner coming in hot behind him and a catcher ready to receive the throw. In one fell swoop, he snagged Darren and carried him to safety. It was an incredible scene and JT Snow, despite hitting over 400 that World Series and having a great postseason and career, is still remembered largely for being the hero that day. Darren Baker went on to play college ball at Cal and was drafted by the Washington Nationals. He hit 290 in double A in 2022. Number nine, Attack of the Bugs. It was the 2007 playoffs, more specifically the ALDS, and the weather was unusually warm for an October evening in Cleveland. The Yankees were hanging on to a 1 0 lead in the seventh when setup man Jabba Chamberlain entered the game to set things up for Mariano Rivera. Chamberlain had a 0.38 ERA that season with a 12.8 per nine strikeout ratio. In other words, he was practically unhittable. He finished off the seventh inning without an issue. After the game, one Indians player said we were dead in the water. Then when Chamberlain took the mound in the eighth, the bugs attacked. The weather and stadium lights attracted an army of midges, small mosquito-like flies who converged onto the pitching mound. One Yankees player said, I just remember Jabba grabbing the back of his neck to wipe off sweat and his hand was black, full of bugs. It was impossible for Chamberlain to focus as the bugs completely engulfed him. A walk and two wild pitches later, he had given up the tying run. He was visibly shaken and frustrated as bugs continued to wreak havoc throughout his entire appearance. And thanks to those midges, the Indians won the game and the series. Number eight, the big unit versus the bird. Next up, we have an absolute one in a billion moment I still can't believe actually happened. And it only ranks this low because it happened in spring training. We all know the story, the premier pitcher in the game, current Hall of Famer Randy Johnson was pitching against Giants prospect Calvin Murray in spring training. Somehow a bird happened to fly right through the path of a 95 mile per hour fastball, resulting in the tragic end of the poor bird's life in an explosion of feathers. In all the years I've watched baseball, I've never noticed a bird happen to fly right in between the batter and the pitcher. And if a bird did happen to fly through that area, what are the odds that the baseball that is thrown by a pitcher ends up being in the exact same place at the exact same time? They have to be astronomical odds. Add that to the fact that it was Randy Johnson who threw the pitch and this incident becomes simply unbelievable. If this happened in a movie, I would instantly laugh it off and call the writers out for how unrealistic the scene was, explaining that such a thing would never, could never actually happen. And I still can't believe it actually did. Number seven, a three foot seven pinch hitter. In 1951, former owner of the Cleveland Indians, Bill Veck, purchased the St. Louis Browns and came up with some wild innovations and publicity stunts to try to compete with the St. Louis Cardinals, the more popular team at the time. By far, his most famous decision was to sign Eddie Goodell, a three foot seven, 60 pound professional performer that Vec found through a booking agency. Goodell was issued a uniform with the number one eighth and popped out of a paper mache cake in between games of a double header to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the American League. At first, it was seen as one of Vic's more mild stunts, and the promoter was actually a bit disappointed, but little did they know 
what Vec had in store for the second game of the doubleheader. It was the bottom of the first inning when Browns manager Zach Taylor sent up the little man to pinch hit. He had been added to the active roster and the umpires had no choice but to let him play. Pitcher Bob Kane laughed at the absurdity of the situation and the catcher had to catch from his knees. Goodell walked on four pitches and bowed to the crowd a few times on his way to first in one of the wildest scenes in MLB history. The American League president voided the contract the next day, saying that Vec was making a mockery of the game. Number six, down goes Zimmer. It was during the 2003 ALCS between the Yankees and Red Sox when all hell broke loose in Boston. Tempers flaring between teams is nothing new, nor is an all-out brawl. However, this scene was certainly more bizarre than normal. Things started to heat up when an up-and-in pitch thrown by Pedro Martinez hit Kareem Garcia in the fourth inning. A few minutes later, Garcia slid hard into his second, which resulted in a shoving match and the emptying of dugouts. Later, when Roger Clemens threw a pitch up-and-in to Manny Ramirez, it was on like Donkey Kong. 72-year-old Yankee coach Don Zimmer, who momentarily forgot his age, wanted a piece of Pedro and went straight for him. Martinez sidestepped, grabbed Zimmer's head, and threw him to the ground. It was surreal seeing an active Major League Baseball player throwing an old man to the ground. And to make matters more insane, a few innings later, Yankee pitcher Jeff Nelson got into a fight with a Fenway Park employee in the bullpen and Kareem Garcia hopped over the fence and into the bullpen to help him out. Number five, Psycho. It was the 2000 World Series, known as the Subway Series, between the New York Mets and New York Yankees. This rivalry was fierce, and there had been massive tensions throughout the season between the two teams. There was an especially tense situation occurring between Roger Clemens and Mike Piazza. Piazza had homered in three consecutive at-bats against Clemens until their fourth meeting earlier that season when Clemens hit Piazza in the head with a fastball, causing him to miss the All-Star game. Everyone was eager to see this matchup. What if Clemens hits him again? Would Piazza charge the mound? Or maybe things would get settled on the field with a big strikeout or another long home run. With all the speculation, no one, and I mean no one, could have predicted what actually went down. The barrel of the bat comes back at Roger Clemens and he fires the bat back toward Piazza who is going down the first baseline. Clemens hurled the barrel of the bat which had now turned into a sharp and dangerous weapon towards Piazza. What was he possibly thinking? Did he think Mike Piazza intentionally broke his bat and made sure that the barrel flew towards him? Well, of course, that would make him the greatest hitter to ever live and is obviously not what happened. Clemens claimed that he thought it was a baseball, which makes no sense whatsoever. And even if we took the massive and impossible leap to believe that he couldn't tell the difference between a baseball and a bat, if he thought it was the ball, he would have thrown it towards first base, not angrily towards Piazza. Benches empty, but there was no brawl, as most players were probably completely confused and shocked. Clemens wasn't even thrown out of the game, probably because no one could believe what they just saw. Number four two batters at one time. This is a screenshot from a game between the Cardinals and Cubs that was played on September 22, 1974. How did this happen? It was a 5-5 game in the top of the ninth inning and the mad Hungarian Al Roboski was on the mound. Roboski was famous for an extended ritual that he performed in which he turned his back to home plate, forcing the batter to wait out the ritual. The Cubs were not in the mood on this day. Gary Madlock decided to make Roboski wait for him instead, walking away from the batter's box to add some pine tar to his bat. Umpire Shag Crawford ordered Madlock to return to the box. When he didn't hear him or didn't comply, Crawford started calling strikes because no one was in the batter's box, which brought out Cubs manager Jim Marshall to argue. The hitter that was on deck, Jose Cardinal, got into the argument as well and at one point had ventured near home plate as Crawford continued to call strikes. Cardinal instinctively jumped into the batter's box to try to hit before Crawford called the third strike and around that same time Madlock ran up and tried to jump in to hit as well creating this insanely bizarre scenario in which two hitters were in the batter's box at the same time. Even the announcer literally said on the air that this is some wild shit. Pretty uh, wild shit. Things didn't end there as an all-out brawl broke out between the two teams 
Cardinals player Ted Simmons punched Madlock, and Cubs player Andre Thornton suffered a finger injury that ended his season. Order was eventually restored, but this may be the only time in MLB history where two batters were ready to take a swing at the exact same time. Number three, Disco Demolition Night. In 1979, Mike Vick, son of the aforementioned Bill Vick, was the Chicago White Sox front office promotion manager, and he came up with a crazy idea. Like father, like son. In Mike's case, it was not a publicity stunt, rather a promotion that allowed fans to enter the ballpark for just 98 cents if they brought a disco record along with them. The records would all be destroyed in between the games of a doubleheader, officially ending the disco era. Over 50,000 people showed up with the records in hand, and many more leapt fences and gates to enter the ballpark during the game. The boxes that fans were supposed to put their records in overflowed, causing many of them to take their records to their seats with them. The records, along with many other dangerous items, were being thrown around the stadium, and the game had to be halted several times. The ceremony indeed occurred and records were blown up, but they left a huge hole in the playing field, which would have made the next game difficult to play, even if thousands of fans didn't storm the field, which they did. They set fire to the field, pulled up bases, destroyed equipment, and took over the stadium. The rioters overwhelmed security, and the best they could do was try to put on the scoreboard, please return to your seats. It wasn't too effective. The second game had to be forfeited by the White Sox, and to this day, Disco Demolition Night is one of the most infamous and disastrous promotions of all time. Number two, Independence Day in Atlanta. It was one of the most wacky and unlikely chain of events in MLB history, and it started on the 4th of July of 1985, but didn't end until the 5th. The Mets were in Atlanta, and the game, which started like any other, was quickly becoming something else. There were multiple rain delays, arguments, ejections, and a fireworks display planned for after the game. When that would be, nobody knew. After nine innings, the game was tied at eight and continued into extras. In the top of the 13th inning, now the next day, the Mets took a 10-8 lead and it looked like this long night would finally be over when with two outs in the bottom of the 13th, Terry Harper hit a home run to tie the game. The game continued and in the top of the 18th, the Mets scored another run. In the bottom half, the Braves had run out of position players. Their last hope was a relief pitcher named Rick Camp. Camp was a notoriously awful hitter with a career 061 batting average entering the season. He had never hit anything close to a home run. It looked like this crazy 18-inning game was about to come to an end. And here's what happened. And he is at the deep left. He goes back. It is gone. Holy cow. Oh, my goodness. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Rick Kim. Rick Kim. Mets players were stunned. Ray Knight threw his hands up in disbelief. Lenny Dykstra dropped to his knees. When Camp first stepped up to the plate, the home plate umpire had joked, you might as well hit one out. We can play all night. Hey, I was kidding. I was only kidding! The Mets went on to score five in the top of the 19th and ended up winning the game, but the camp home run was still one of the craziest moments in MLB history. And to make this scene even more wild, the fireworks still went off at about four in the morning, prompting 911 phone calls from residents who thought the city was being bombed. Number one, 10 cent beer night. It was 1974, and in an effort to improve attendance, the Cleveland Indians decided to hold 10 cent beer night, offering 10 ounce beers for just 10 cents with no limit on the number of purchases. What could possibly go wrong? To make matters worse, this promotion occurred in a game between the Indians and Rangers, two teams that had just gotten into a bench clearing brawl a few days earlier, and the Indians fans were in a rowdy mood. Over 25,000 fans showed up to 10 cent beer night more than double that was expected. Almost immediately, it was apparent there were going to be problems. A woman ran out onto the field, flashed the crowd, and tried to kiss the umpire. Later, a naked man ran onto the field and slid into second base. The very next inning, a father and son ran out onto the field and mooned the fans. 
the stadium started to look like a war zone as fans began randomly setting off firecrackers. They threw items onto the field like hot dogs and wrappers and other naked people started appearing throughout the stadium. Gunpowder and marijuana smoke covered the entire ballpark. By the seventh inning, all the sober fans had already departed, leaving an army of extremely drunk belligerents who stormed the field armed with knives and clubs formed from portions of the stadium that they tore apart. Indians players and Rangers players grabbed bats and the war was on in one of the most unbelievable scenes in the history of the game. Eventually the players escaped to the safety of the clubhouse and the uncontrollable beasts destroyed the field and stadium for 20 minutes until the police were able to restore order. The Indians were forced to forfeit the game and several players and umpires were injured. The Indians actually had the guts to hold another 10 cent beer night that season, but this time there was a two beer per person limit. And that does it for today's list of the top 10 most wild and wacky moments in MLB history. And I'm sure there were many others as well. So put your examples in that comment section down below. I hope you all enjoyed today's video. Please look forward to another one next week. And if you enjoyed it, hit the thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. And there's also a join button down below if you'd like to help support the channel on a monthly basis, which helps me to make even more content. Thank you so much again. Have a great day and we will talk to you next time.